This weekend, we just had the largest Lorcana tournament ever held, with a massive prize pool of $10,000 and 374 total participants. Bayer Beastie has once again made competitive Lorcana history. Today, we'll be covering the top 16 decks. It's absolutely incredible to see the deck variety in all the decks that made it to day two, especially considering how late into the set we are. Massive props to Ravensburger for designing such a naturally well balanced game. First up, we have Humble's deck, uh, also known as Corey Patrick. They came in with a very spicy red Fasa list that actually completely destroyed me in round seven. I was playing a Ruby Amethyst list, so they were quite favored, but this deck was built so well and they piloted it so skillfully that there was really nothing I could do. A key factor that made this deck so difficult to deal with is that I opted not to run Fishhook and they are running multiple evasive uh, cards that quest for two. So it can apply a lot of pressure that without hitting a B prepared, I can't interact with. And even if I do find that B prepared, they still have the Mufasa to retain some extra board presence after the board wipe. I do recall at one point, even during the game, I traded into the Mufasa thinking that I was going to maybe win that game. I had a very good board state and then they ripped a Chernobog straight off the top and that really sealed my fate for that match. If you want to see the match, it'll be on the VOD for the stream from this past Saturday. Now, some key differences from normal Red Fasted lists, other than the evasives, is also that we're seeing at four copies of Sleepy. Uh, this card does come with a downside of when it enters play, it's exerted, but it has a very respectable two free stat line, which makes it survive lots of removal cards like Let the Storm Rage On, fire the cannons and grab your swords and still be able to quest for two. So even if you had this as a Mufasa hit, there's a decent chance that it could survive. Our main draw engine here is obviously the Mother Gothel Rapunzel package, but we still do have four copies of Pongo. And while it is an X and two, so it can be more easily removed, for example, in the Ruby Amethyst matchup, where I don't have a lot of removal spells, you're going to be able to get lots of turns of value by drawing cards. We also see two copies of Scar being run here. This is a great way to deal with wide boards without needing to run B prepared, because if you did run B prepared, then that's a chance that uh, when you have a Mufasa hit, you're not going to be able to get any value if you end up whiffing and hitting a non-character card. So that's why Humble here. Uh, I believe for the last month or two has opted to only run 60 character card decks in their Mufasa list. Interestingly here, we see that there is no Pluto. In fact, we have opted to drop the one drops entirely. I think this does make a decent amount of sense because it ups the heaviness of our deck so that we're more likely to get a good Mufasa hit. We don't necessarily need it because um, you can go for the two drop into dock into five drop line, or you can just go for the Gothel into Mini into Heal of Rapunzel line. So you're going to be able to put on a lot of pressure by questing with Mini. And then the 3-4 Gothel is going to be able to trade into your opponent's board quite cleanly. There's not really much else to say here other than this is quite a top-heavy list. We are running four copies of Surfer Stitch as another draw tool, but mainly just a big body that doesn't get removed by Medusa as it's a four, uh, four attack character. And we also have four copies of Maleficent Dragon. I'm not sure how often you'll be reaching the nine ink required to play it unless you're in a whole new world matchup where you're being fueled more cards but it does make it much more likely that you're going to be able to uh, get it off a Mufasa hit. Very interestingly though to note for the removal is that there is four copies of Lady Tremaine and a lot of Ruby decks we're seeing a split between Tremaine and Medusa but Humble here has opted to just run the Tremaines, probably because it's a two law quester. Uh, so that means after they do remove pretty much uh, any card on the board that your opponent chooses, we're probably still happy because we're going to be able to keep questing for game. The aim of this deck, unlike a traditional Ruby deck, is just to build a board and quest with it. There's not really many ways of being able to reactively take a board back after your opponents gain the tempo, other than Scar. Next up in top 16, we have quite a spicy purple steel list from Matthias. What's really interesting here is there is no Jafar. So normally a mid-range purple steel list is running Jafar or they go more low to the ground and run bodyguard characters and maybe a Tiana. Uh, so in this case, we're sort of going in the middle here where we're not going as top heavy and combo reliant and whole new world reliant as Jafar, but we're still running a, a fair few low to the ground characters to be able to quest the game. Uh, we do have Quite a lot of removal tools in the form of Smash and along came uh, Zeus. Uh, Smash is very relevant because X and Freeze like Ursula and Ariel you want to remove before they get a chance to sing and quest. Uh, and then along come Zeus is singable from our four cost characters like Goat and Rabbit and even our five cost like Robin Hood, which we can shift into on turn three and then instantly sing on turn three. So on turn three, we're accessing all of our removal tools 
let the storm rage on, smash Zeus, and we're accessing friends on the other side to draw cards if we need to. So the, as we all know, the Amethyst package is very resilient. What is quite spicy here is the boss is on a roll. It gets you an extra lore, and then you're able to scry and decide what order you want to draw your cards in. So this is a great card to sing right before you sing a friends on the other side. So you can select exactly what two cards you want to draw. A card I haven't seen very often is Razul. So Razul, quest for one, and is sort of like a Smee because it's a free free, but uh, it's only while it has no jack damage, but it gets the plus to attack. Otherwise, it's a one free. Probably most of the time it's a free free, except when you're going into another steel deck that has Tinker Bells to ping some damage onto you. You'd probably rather play a Smee in most situations, but I suppose if you don't get the Smee, Resul's still a very reliable stat line. See, we're running some Captain Hooks for the early game. We're running four copies of Benja for the item removal. I think this was a pretty good medical as loots and lanterns and dimes are all very meta relevant right now. And other than that, there's not much to say. It's just some of the best cards in Steel mixed with some of the best cards in Amethyst, some very consistent draw tools when synergizing with bosses in a roll. And you're really just looking to build a board and tempo out your opponent while singing a, a removal spell like Zeus and Storm in order to control the board. Next up in top 16, we have a Ruby Sapphire list from uh, Joshua Freeman Birch. What's really interesting this tournament is that there were four Ruby Sapphire lists in top 16. It was a very good meta call as they do quite well into Amber Steel uh, and Blue Steel, which are both uh, pretty relevant in the meta right now. I think they struggle more into aggro decks, but the aggro decks are getting removed by all the steel decks in the meta right now. So I think Ruby Sapphire specifically was a pretty good choice to bring for this tournament. It's also a big reason that I didn't bring Blue Steel to the tournament. I ended up bringing Ruby Amethyst, and I was able to 2-0 both my uh, Ruby Sapphire opponents in the Swiss thanks to that decision. Uh, the most interesting thing to note here, a uh, player at Locals was running this combo. Uh, the Mota Nui location means that when you have a character there and it gets banished, it goes straight into your inkwell, ramping you. This synergizes amazingly with the two-cost rush stitch they have and the two-cost Queen of Hearts rush they have, so that you can add, play it for two, attach it to Mota Nui for one, trade in, remove one of your opponent's characters, and ramp. That's a ton of value and a way to control the early game and get to your late game control cards. Uh, we're seeing locations are very relevant in this meta, especially with Things like Be Prepared running around and all the steel decks, which unless they're running Rise of Titans, have quite a hard time dealing with locations, which makes Mukduck Mana really good to play. They're running three copies here. And instead of opting for one jump ahead, like some Ruby Sapphire decks are, we have Fishbone Quill, obviously, along with the Motonui. We have the Haram Popsicle Tamatoa package for our item recycling and draw. We have Judy Hops for item removal and an alternate way to cycle our Popsicles. And we're running the small Grandma Tala as a scry, but not the larger Grand Martala, so sort of a similar role to what Gaston is used for in Blue Steel. And then we have, interestingly enough, one copy of Nick as, again, a Popsicle Retriever. I guess uh, if you need to get it earlier than getting Tamatoa online, there's three copies of Gaston, so that's extra forms of scry to find the removal cards you might need, like, say, a Be Prepared, which you could sing off the remaining one copy of Scar, a great way to deal with wide boards, and if it lives, sing Be Prepared on the next turn. And yeah, the four copies of Tomato are really what gonna close out games here. If you're able to recycle those popsicles, get them on the board, get the fishbone quills on the board, get back lucky dimes that have been wheeled away by a whole new world from your uh, discard pile, and you're looking at a very consistent end game plan here. I think four copies of Be Prepared is definitely correct. And instead of opting for a 2-2 Medusa Tremaine split, like most decks seem to be doing, they are running four copies of Medusa Obviously seeing the need to deal with aggro decks and the specific targets, which are high high threats, uh, rather than the Tremaine just letting your opponent choose what to banish. I think that's probably the correct choice for uh, this current meta, where people are building much wider boards. Obviously four copies of Maui, standard card and ruby, and then four copies of Maleficent Dragon, just a really nice high-end card to reach, and if you draw it in the early game, it's still inkable. Yeah, a very solid list, and again, four develop your brain, makes your deck go from like 60 cards to 56 cards. Very, very nice consistency tool. And there's another scry along with the Grandma Tanner and Gaston. Next up, we have another red-blue list in the top 16, this time by Sean Brandt. Uh, they are running actually quite a different list. So they, they're not going for Motonui. They've instead opted for the small Grandma Tallers. They're not, they don't have any uh, shifting Grandma Tallers. So the small Grandma Tallers are a great way to just keep questing and apply pressure or trade into any X and Ones. 
uh, most notably the two uh, the two lore questers like Maleficent and Lilo. Uh, we're running one copy of Shield of Virtue. I think this is a great one of to run in these Tomatoa heavy lists, as after you quest with Tomatoa to grab an item and get a bunch of lore, you can then re-ready it with Shield of Virtue, or you can re-ready a Scar, oh sorry, not a Scar, or you can re-ready it or a Maleficent to then sing a Be Prepared after questing. Great way to get some extra value there. It's also an alternate way to just get some draw from Haram if you can't find your popsicles. Once again, running free Judy Hops for the item removal, and unlike the other uh, deck, we're running free Mickey Mouse. So this is another way to uh, ramp in the early game and still put a body on the board, along uh, much like Grandma Tala. And then we're running two copies of Bell, so this synergizes amazingly with Dime, as much like in Blue Steel, for only 13 lore, you can play a Bell, play a Dime, and then tap the Dime to gain 5 lore instantly and threaten 10 lore on the next turn. Very, very, very dangerous combo. As you can see here, they've opted for the 2-2 split of Tremaine and Medusa. They like, a, uh, they like the flexibility um, to be able to choose between a high value target amongst a wide board or a very top heavy uh, single target on a small board that normally Medusa can't remove. It also comes with the benefit of being able to quest for two. Once again, like the last list, we are running two copies of Dime as a closer and three copies of Mana so that we have something that survives and be prepared. Very interestingly, very interestingly, they've teched in a Maui's fish hook here. I think this makes a lot of sense as a way to deal with all the evasives in the meta, such as the Mini Mouse Surfer in Ruby Amethyst, and interestingly enough, the Red Fossa uh, evasives that are now being run by Humble, as we saw earlier. Other than that, it's pretty much the same deck, so let's just move on. Next up in top 16, we probably have the spiciest list of the entire top cut of the decks that made it to day two. We have Amethyst Emerald by Diego Saz, but it's not your normal aggro Amethyst Emerald running Cursed Merfolk and Kit. It's actually more of a mid-range version running some discard options and one of my favorite cards, Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo, and a card that I thought would work very well in Mill, Lyle Tiberius Rook. At the start, you can see we're running the one free Flynn Riders. We're not running the shift. This is just to have an X and free that survives and can quest. Uh, this makes a lot of sense in the flute song meta um, with all the grab your swords, fire the cannons, uh, let the storm rage on. You know, we see in blue steel and flutes and amber steel. Uh, we have the Rafikis, which synergize well with Pinocchio to destroy one of your opponent's X and freeze, maybe even their turn one or two play if you're on the draw or the play. Uh, we're running the Kuzco's for draw, card draw, the classic Man and Mim Snake Amethyst Engine, Ursula, two drop for the song discard, and then as I mentioned, three copies of Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo. Uh, this can uh, combo very nicely with cards like Ursula to discard multiple songs. It can combo with Pinocchio to uh, exert multiple characters. It can even combo with Goat to gain multiple lore. Rabbit to gain multiple cards, and Lucifer to discard multiple of your opponent's cards, and Elsa to exert multiple of your opponent's characters. This is a very, very, very spicy list, and of course, Genie to bounce multiple of your opponent's characters back to hand. The reason this works is because Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo has a very specific interaction where you can actually bounce a card back to your hand and then play the exact same card, even though the text specifies it has to be another card. Because that card's becoming private info, even if you only had one card in your hand, uh, it would still count as a new card because it's, because it's gone into private info, so you technically can't confirm that it's the same card. Which is a bit silly when there's only one card left, but luckily for Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo, that's how that interaction is ruled. We see, obviously, friends on the other side for the card draw, and Lyle Tiberius works really interesting, so not only can you give an opposing character Reckless, so that sort of like John Silver Jasper effect, but it does it on play so you can prevent an opponent questing and force them to challenge to maybe make a favorable trade for your board. But also, whenever one of our other characters is banished, our opponent loses one lore. So while we're trying to exert, uh, get rid of our opponent's resources and slow them down until we can win in the end with our bouncing goats to push to 20 lore, uh, we're able to lower our opponent's lore count. There's not many effects in the game that can do that well. Obviously, we've got the Fox for control, two copies of Maleficent for draw, three copies of Crab to make favorable trades and deal with locations. Again, this can work well with Bibbidi Bobbidi Boo if you need to get a bunch of attack to deal with a high health location like McDuck's Manor. And then everyone's most favorite card and probably most hated card of the set is the Ursula Singer card. So we're going to be able to get multi we're going to be able to sing multiple bibbidi bobbidi boos which is probably insane if you <laughs> if you're able to 
sing multiple bibbidi bobbidi boos, and then bounce a goat back and forth from your hand multiple times, entering and leaving play to gain a bunch of lore in one turn, or even just a rabbit to refill your hand. Uh, and we see two copies of Wildcat, an evasive 2 free. It can exert itself to banish an item. Very, very underrated item removal option in Emerald. And three copies of Queen's Castle. Everyone knows how good that card is. It's very survivable. It gains you two lore a turn at the start of a turn every turn, and it has seven HP. And if you have any cards attached to it, at the start of your turn, you draw cards. Definitely the best location card of the set. And finally, to top it off, we have our Lucifers to discard. We have our Genies to bounce, and it's an evasive that can quest for two. And then we have Elsa to be able to freeze our... Uh, and then we have Elsa to be able to stun our opponent's board and then quest for free and hopefully recycle it with our bouncing effects. Next up is the top 16 deck from Aaron Rubin. It is an amber steel list. I believe they're also known as Lorcana Bro. And it's looking like a pretty standard flute song list. You've got your singing Cinderella's to control the early game. that can also shift into big Cinderella's later on. We've got our Robin Hoods and Queens that can also shift um, at turns three and two respectively. Got our four copies of Smee, because that card's nuts. Four copies of Flutes. Three Bear Necessities, which is a very strong card in this meta. You're able to remove any non-character card. So that includes actions, that includes songs, that includes items like Annoyingly Fishbone Quill when you're playing Blue Steel. And it includes locations like Queen's Castle, which otherwise the deck can have trouble dealing with. And then we have our Aerial Singer, which has been insane since set one. You can dig five to find a song and then sing up to a five cost card. Uh, we have two copies of Benja as item removal. I imagine this is very helpful in Amber Steel Mirrors where they aren't running Pride Lands. And we have Let the Storm Rage On. Again, Cinderella can sing this. Our free cost can sing this. Strength of a Raging Fire, another early removal tool for Cinderella. You can play a one cost on turn one, then two more one cost on turn two, and then sing to deal up to three damage to remove any of your opponent's turn one plays unless they have ward. Here, so we have our three copies of Along Comes Zeus to remove those mid-range threats, four copies of Rapunzel for draw, Smee as it loses a damage every turn is a great way to draw two by the time you get the Rapunzel uh, online as long as you've been exerting it each turn. Uh, through questing uh, then four copies of whole new world it's what this deck relies on you get an early turn three turn four turn five whole new world to refresh your hand after you've sung all your songs and played all your cards only two copies of grab your sword interestingly enough i found two copies of grab your sword wasn't enough at blue steel but it's probably enough in amber steel because we have a lot we have a lot more options for removal or robin hood an insane card in this meta it shifts on turn three quest for two uh, when it banishes a character, it gains two lore, so you don't even have to choose between questing and challenging if you don't want to. And when it's removed, it draws a card, and it's a free six, so it survives a Zeus, it survives so many uh, char characters, and you can get it out on turn three. It's one of the most insane cards in the game, which also makes it very expensive. Uh, the only downside is it can be removed by Medusa because of that free attack. And then you have the four copies of Queen and two copies of Big Cinderella, which again is a very hard card to deal with, and not many people are running Let It Goes or Dragon Fires, and there's not as many Ruby decks around running Be Prepared, so Cinderella can be very, very sticky in a lot of matchups. I know as Blue Steel, it's impossible to deal with without a Let It Go. Lastly, for top 16, we have Brennan DeCandio's Amber Steel list. They are on the Lantern version, and once again, they're running, I believe this time, 63 cards. So we decided since last tournament, maybe 66 was too much. We can get it down to 63. And who knows, maybe one day we'll see him play a 60 card deck. Not today though. Uh, they are a two time Fair Beastie champion. They have top cut in every Fair Beastie tournament they've played. Arguably the best player in Lorcana right now. Let's have a look at their list. Uh, we've got the stock standard Cinderella Robin Hood Queen, one cost singers, but there's only three Queen as we're only running three large Queen. We have the four lanterns. Uh, with everyone seeming to be cutting item removal, the lanterns are probably a lot stickier than they were a couple weeks ago, uh, especially as everyone's shifting to Pride Lands and Amber Steel. Uh, three copies of Bear Necessities, as we talked about, very good card. We have the Aerials. We've gone up to three copies of Benja and down and then down to three copies of Storm Strength and Zeus. So there's our removal. Down to three copies of Rapunzel. I, I very much like the three copies of Rapunzel. I don't think you're very often going to be able to use all four Rapunzels in a game. And, you're not, and especially if you're not running Smees, uh, like we aren't in this list because we're running the Lanterns, then you're not going to have a reliable way to trigger those Rapunzels. We have the four whole new worlds. We have the three Beast Tragic Heroes, which everyone seems to be cutting recently because of 
how removable they are by Zeus and Medusa, but they're just such a good card that I understand the need to run them as a way to find your next couple of whole new worlds. And then we've gone up to free grab your sword, great for dealing with aggro decks, great in the mirror for dealing with very wide boards. And then our four Robin Hoods, our three Queens, three Tinkerbells, so combined with grab your swords, we can deal with X and three boards and then still have a body that quests for two and can threaten evasive cards with the deal two damage effect. Three copies of Big Cinderella and then two copies of Big Surface Stitch. Normally quite a hard card to reach as you have to hard play it on seven cost, but with the lanterns, we can get there a turn early, maybe two turns early if we have two lanterns. And the 4 8 body that quests for two is just an insane card to be running in this meta. It doesn't get removed by Medusa, it doesn't get removed by Zeus. And when you play it, if you have two or more characters on the board, which you often do with Amber Steel, you get to draw two cards. It's unfortunate we didn't get to see Decandio do the hat trick and get three tournaments back to back to back, but I'm sure we'll be seeing more of them in Lorcana's future, especially as organized play uh, becomes an option for our players to prove themselves as the best Lorcana player. We have one more list in top 16. This is a Amethyst Ruby list by Michael Monzen. They're running a fairly standard list, but one that's quite similar to mine uh, with the key... Uh, one. One that's quite similar to the one I played in the tournament, with the key exceptions of they are only running four copies of the one free, so four minis as opposed to four Olafs. Uh, sorry, as opposed to like four Olafs, two minis, or however you want to do that split. I know there's uh, some argument to be made of running the Olaf so you don't reveal that you're not just an Amethyst deck, try and hide your ink combo, but honestly... It's, it's, a very, it's very minimal, it's rarely going to come up, so just play whatever card you want, whatever card you have. Uh, then we've got the four copies of Rafiki, which synergize very nicely with Pinocchio on a turn two to clear your opponent's one, uh, one or two drop. And then four copies of Cusco, four copies of Snake, and then two copies of Teeth, which synergizes very nicely with our X Freeze so that we can deal two damage to one of our opponent's board. Very good into Amber Steel, very good into Emerald Bliss as well. We have our friends on the other side, our Rush with Fox, two copies of Maleficent for draw. And then the key tech card here is one copy of Maui's fish hook. So not only can this give cards evasive to survive after they trade into something or quest, but it can also give them evasive to deal with opposing evasive characters like Minnie Mouse Surfer in the Ruby Amphis Mirror. Uh, we have the four copies of Crab. A lot of people actually cut Crab down to three copies. I cut Crab down to three copies. It seems very, very much value for four copies of Crab here. Four Goat. Four Fox, four Queen's Castle, all very standard here. And if you're running four Queen's Castle, why not play a single Jim Hawkins? I was on a single Jim Hawkins before. I ended up cutting it because I didn't think it came up enough to be worth it, and I wanted more thing, uh, more options to affect the early game. But hey, when it when it pops off, it pops off. You're playing nine ink worth of resources. It is definitely an insane turn. And then we have four copies of Maui, a two-two split of Tremaine and Medusa, and then four copies of Deep Head. All very standard stuff for a Ruby Amethyst list. And next up, we are going into the top eight. So these are people who won their first match in the top cut. So they didn't just make it through the Swiss. They had to win their top 16 match too to make it into the quarterfinals. And first up, we have Emerald Steel by Alexis Valentin. Uh, this looks a lot like the list that Specky uh, brewed and brought to Poznan, Poland. Uh, you know, I, I know this. <laughs> I recognize this even though I don't play a lot of Emerald Steel by the four Friar Tucks and the three Daisy Duck. I remember Specky said that they thought Daisy Duck wasn't a very impactful card for them during the tournament. In one case, it even hurt them more than it helped them. It'll be, but it's interesting. Uh, it'll be interesting to know how Alexis thought Daisy Duck performed for them during this tournament and in the day one of Swiss, especially. So as you can see, we're running four copies of Captain Hook to control the early game, four copies of Merfolk to pressure the board and force your opponent to discard, two Baboom so that we can react to very key meta threats that are at two HP, like uh, Cinderella and Amber Steel. We have four copies of Flynn, which again have a discard effect like Merfolk and Quest for Two, but in this case a 1-2 stat line instead of 0-1 and it's inkable. Uh, the four copies of Smee, absolutely nuts card. Four copies of Dis uh, Sudden Chill that we can sing so that e uh, we can force our opponent to discard a card. Four Ursula so that we can discard a song of our choosing and see our opponent's hand. Three copies of Benja for item removal. Four copies of Let the Storm Rage On for a uh, board control that we can uh, double sing with Ursula. Same with two copies of Mother Knows Best to bounce cards back to hand. Four copies of Prince John. Now this card is nuts. It is a ward card. Uh, the quest for two doesn't really matter, 
What really matters, uh, I mean, it does matter later on, but what really matters is whenever your opponent discards a card, you may draw a card. So if you just stick these on the board and your opponent doesn't have a form of AoE removal, like grab your sword or be prepared, then they're just going to stay on that board, drawing a card for every card that they force you to discard. Uh, and combined with things like Ursula, Sudden Chill, and Friar Tuck, that's very, very difficult to deal with. We have the four strength of range of fire, which again, Ursula can double sing to, rem to re uh, remove a either a very tall card or multiple smaller cards, depending on our board size. Again, as we mentioned, four copies of Singing Ursula is insane. Two copies of Long Come Zeus for when you need to just do a bit more damage, and we can sing these on the Daisy Duck and Friar Tuck. Uh, Daisy Duck, each opponent... Uh, Whenever this character quests, each opponent uh, chooses and discards a card. Then the 4 Friar Tuck, when you play this character, the player with the least cards in their ha hand chooses and discards a card. So if, you're, if you've already forced your opponent to discard a bunch of cards, this isn't very helpful. But let's say your opponent does have more cards than you, you can start with a Friar Tuck and then play your other discard cards to reduce your opponent's hand size and still put a very nice 2-4 quest for 2 body on the board. And finally, we have the four copies of Beast Tragic Hero, which is uh, what Specky wasn't running in the Poland tournament, but kind of, I believe, kind of wished he did, as it's a great way to dig into your deck and find more cards to affect the board and, and control your opponent's hand. Next up in top eight, we have Amethyst Emerald by Merc LC. This is the aggro version of the list that's been running around, I've been telling you about. We start off with a two copies of Chernobog's Followers which is a great card because whenever you quest, you get to choose to banish it to draw a card, or you can just leave it on the board if you feel like it's not threatened for the next turn uh, by removal or being challenged into. Four copies of Merfolk, four copies of Rafiki, four copies of Flynn, all very standard stuff for this ink at this point. We have the Snake for bounce. We have the one copy of Pinocchio to control our opponent's board, and then we can bounce it back to our hand if we need to re reduce, reuse, and recycle for further uses. That's the name of the game for Amethyst. Our four Ursulas uh, to discard songs. Four friends for draw. One of my favorite cards in this list is Free Kick Cloud Kicker. It's a great tempo tool as you put a card on the board while bouncing your opponent's early play back to hand. Uh, we have a Four Fox Rush, Free Maleficent for draw, Free Cat Crab for location and uh, challenge and trading up into larger characters. For location control and trading up into larger characters, a Free Mother's Best, which uh, again, along with the friends, can be double sung by the Singing Ursula, which we have four copies of. Four Goat, Four Rabbit, Free Castle, all very, very, very standard Amethyst stuff. And then, interestingly, we have two copies of Yzma as some top-end removal. Um, some people used to run Genie in this slot because it would also be an evasive that quest. But with Yzma, you can uh, shuffle the opponent's card back into their deck so you actually get around any on-banishing effects while basically banishing it. But the downside is your opponent gets to draw two cards, which... Hopefully, with a deck this fast, they don't. <laughs> those two cards don't end up mattering because you have enough stuff on the board to be able to quest for game. For our next top eight list, we have another Ruby Sapphire deck. This time by God SLLI. Looks pretty much the same as the last couple ones we saw, with the key exceptions of running four one jump ahead as a ramp tool instead of Grandma Tala and Mickey Mouse Detective. Uh, mostly everything else is the same. We're running uh, a split of Medusa and Tremaine, but we have uh, five total, so we're running three Medusa. Uh, weirdly, we're running three Be Prepared. Not sure I agree with it in a deck that's this control heavy, where you're going to be going so late into the game, and you need those Be Prepareds a lot of the time to reset the board. Four Be Prepared is really where I'd want to be, especially if we get wheeled. You don't want to have basically all your Be Prepareds wheeled away, as it's the main way you recover against Steel decks. We have one copies of, uh, copy of Hades. It's sort of like a Maleficent, but it's uninkable, comes two turns earlier, and it ramps your opponent. You have two copies of Dime, two copies of Scar, which is great for dealing with wide boards. If you don't want to be prepared, say you already have a board established, or you want to set up a Sing Be Prepared for the next turn, then four Tamatoa, four Maleficent Dragon. Very standard stuff, uh, with the key exception of going down on Be Prepared. What's really interesting to me is that we've seen four Red Blue, and two of them have made it into the top eight. It shows that Red Blue was a really good medical for this tournament. I'm sure we'll be seeing lots of Red Blue in the weeks to come in your set championships, and especially in the first Lorcana organized play challenge tournaments. But it's going to be really hard to read the meta though because it's been so diverse so far. Next up in top eight, we have our first Sapphire Steel list. This has been piloted by Daniel Vesens or Cherik, Serik. 
And what's uh, I've actually seen them talking a lot in the Sapphire Steel thread on the 20 Law Pro Discord. This pretty much looks like a stock standard uh, sky list that they've been playing uh, up to rank one ladder on the hardcore ladder on Pixelborn. Uh, the key defining aspects of this deck are that we're running free hook to control the early game. We're running one fire the cannons as a way to counter amber steel. I've been personally experimenting with upping that to two fire the cannons. We've got the obviously the fishbone quill, the smees, the popsicles for draw. Three Mickey Mouse Detectives so that we have seven ways of ramping to a five cost on turn four. Two Rise of Titans for dealing with items, but especially locations like Queen's Castle. Uh, one copy of Zeus. Two copies of Bell. Uh, this is obviously a great way to ramp and set up a threat with, um, if you're about to wheel just before you wheel. So that uh, on the next turn you hit 10 ink and you're able to quest for five. More importantly, it synergizes with Dime as a way to tap for instant lore and recover in the lore race once you've ramped up and gained control of the board. We have our four harams for draw, our three manners, which survive be prepared, so they're great to play into ruby matchups, and they're good to play into steel decks to slow them down and give you a chance to build up resources. Four whole new worlds, four copies of Beast Tragic Hero. A lot of people have been cutting down. I cut these down to three copies in my Poland list. We have our four Cogsworth, our beautiful beloved card that makes Sapphire so worth playing, especially into the steel heavy meta. Three, grab your sword to control the board. One, let it go as an alternate removal option that can be sung just like Zeus. Uh, and is our one out to Big Cinderella. Three copies of Gaston. Uh, it's an alternate way to gain lore with Dime and still scry and search our deck and be a singer. Uh, four copies of Tinkerbell. Combined with grab your sword, we can clear boards of X and Freeze, which is very important in the Ruby Amethyst matchup. And then two copies of Lucky Dime as our lore closer. The very stock standard stuff, but they had to pile it very well to get to this point. So congratulations to you, Sarek. Next up, as our first deck in top four, we have quite a spicy Emerald Steel list. This is a Tiana discard list. So they've been seeing all the songs in the meta, especially within Amber Steel. And they're saying, hey, why don't we play Tiana so that we stop them from playing songs? and then just run a deck that can quest and win for game. We do this through our four copies of Merfolk, like we see in the Emerald Amethyst list, our four copies of Robin Hood that can shift into big Robin Hood on turn three, three copies of Baboom to control the early game, and if you want to, deal damage to a location, four Flim Rider, four Smee, four Sudden Chill for discard, four Ursula for song discard and seeing our opponent's hand, four Click ca Kick Cloud Kicker, much like we see in the Emerald Amethyst list, this uh, is a great way to protect our Flynn Rider and Murfolk from being traded into and maintain and push the tempo on the board. Uh, four, let the storm rage on and free strength for raging fire combined with singing Ursula. Again, another great way to control the board and maintain our tempo. Four, Prince John, so that when we discard our opponent's cards, we draw cards. Four, Friar Tuck, like we see in the more mid-range list player on top eight was running. Uh, and then three, Tiana. This is a card that uh, Specky did run in the Poznan event. It was a very, very good tech that worked out well for them because even if you're not preventing them from playing songs, it's still a resist 2-1-4 that quest for 2 every turn. So great in these more aggressive, high-tempo, low-to-the-ground lists. Uh, three copies of Beast Tragic Hero, and then, of course, as the aforementioned for Robin Hood, uh, which is probably the most insane card in the deck other than Ursula. I mean, hey, Ursula and Robin Hood are probably two of the most insane cards in set 3, why not combine them into one deck, right? We're in the home stretch now. In third place, we have a Ruby Amethyst list. This is by Attack for Two. I believe they uh, are part of the Forbidden Mountain channel. Amazing uh, YouTube channel. They make great content. Go check them out if you haven't already. Their name is Dave Solberg. So they are running, again, Ruby Amethyst is pretty much figured out at this point in set three. What's very interesting is that they're running the two Pinocchio, which I very much agree with. I was running two Pinocchio, but they were also running two Maui's Fishhook, and they weren't running Surfer Mini. Instead, they were running four Maleficent. I think this makes them worse into, say, an Emerald Steel or a Blue Steel matchup, and even the Red Blue matchup, but it makes them a lot better into the Mirror, as the Mirror is all about board control and resource gain. With Maleficent, you can draw more cards than your opponent. You don't just have to rely on friends and bouncing rabbit back and forth from your hand. You also have the Maui's fish hook to deal with those opposing, opposing mini mouses. Uh, we're running the free crab. That's the amount I was running as well. Four goat, four rabbit, free castle. I was initially on four castle. I've been convinced by as free castle because usually castle's mostly good when you're going first. So you don't want to draw it in your opening hand when going second. It usually ends up as ink. So I think free is probably the right number. 
uh, for Maui. And instead of choosing a 2-2 split for Tremaine and saying, oh, maybe I'll go 4-0, maybe I'll go 3-1, you know, they've instead just decided to run six copies. They have a free free split with Tremaine and Medusa, so tons more control. If free be prepared, I very much agree with this amount. Four be prepared feels a bit too bricky uh, with how low to the ground we're running the deck these days. But if you run less than free be prepared, then you risk having it wheeled away and not being able to find it in those steel matchups. And then very spicy, uh, very spicy text choice here is that we're running one copy of Scar. So much like in the red blue list, this is a great way to clear a wide board and then hopefully set up a card to sing be prepared on the next turn and flip the tempo of the game and build up your own board. And along with Maui's fish hook, if you have a Maui on board or if you have an extra free ink to spare, you could clear the board with Scar, give it evasive, that protects it from being traded back into, and then sing the Be Prepared on the next turn. Very, very, very cool list, and congratulations on making third place attack for two. And next up, in second place, we have a Sapphire Steel deck piloted by Emmanuel that made it to the finals. It's very, very spicy, looks a lot similar to the Savji's list I've been seeing him playing and floating around a bit. Uh, rather than going for the stock game plan of turn free ramp into five drop every turn they've in, in opted to remove the mickeys for free one jump ahead so that they can ramp to four and then with a four cost sing and along comes zeus to control the board earlier and in that light we're running free fire the cannons which i love because a big struggle of this deck is controlling the early game and free fire the cannons helps you do that by removing key one drops in the meta specifically cinderella and Cursed Merfolk in those Emerald decks. Uh, so because we're running for Robin Hood package, we are running for Robin Hood to be shifted into. You might not play this on turn one. You might need to play a Develop Your Brain or a Pop School to search for a ramp card or a SME. But if you have the shift Robin Hood in your hand, you can look at playing this on turn one or turn two to be able to shift onto it for turn three. Uh, we're running uh, only free SME. This is probably because we're not always going to be playing SME on turn two because we have three copies of one jump ahead. We might want to play one jump ahead if we ramp straight to four. Or if we set up a two cost, we can instead play one jump ahead on turn three and then that guarantees our ramp to five on turn four. And then we have a two copies of Benja for item removal, the standard four fishbone quill. And uh, free alongs comes Zeus because obviously we're planning to sing it with our four cost to control the early game. Stock standard, steel wheel stuff, whole new world. Four Cogsworth, free grab your sword, along with the four Tink, clear X and free boards, two lucky dimes, which again synergize great with Bell. We're not running any Gastons, very interestingly. I suppose they focused more on having board impact than the Gaston, which you're using to probably scry for a whole new world. Uh, and then we have two copies of Tamatoa as a way to recycle our popsicles for more draw or recycle our dimes if they've been discarded by a whole new world. Very, very, very cool list here. Definitely going to be testing it myself over the next few days. I'm going to be sad if I like it more than my original list because I don't know if my wallet can afford buying four Robin Hoods. And now for our final winning list, Christopher Anderson piloted Red Blue to a victory of Lorcana's largest tournament ever, a $10,000 prize pool. So for first place, they earned themselves $2,000, uh, which makes them probably the highest earning uh, Lorcana player in history in a single tournament. Don't fact check me on that because I'm not fact checking myself, but I like to believe it's true because it adds to the drama, it adds to the narrative of it. Uh, and we've got a, a fairly standard red blue list with a few key differences to the ones we've seen earlier here. Uh, most notably, they're running two, cop uh, two copies of Shield of Virtue instead of one, so they very much value that card synergy with their four copies of Tamatoa uh, and their Scar and their Maleficent. And really just any of their rush cards like Maui so that they can re-ready and clear multiple cards. Uh, also that they can quest with a card like Gaston and then re-ready to protect itself. Uh, running three copies of Queen's Hearts to control the early game. Uh, we have our four Fishbone Quill. Only one copy of Judy Hops. Uh, I see they didn't see item removal as necessary as it was previously. I do believe item usage has gone down in the past week or so. So we're starting to see people cut item removal which means maybe it's the time to start putting items back in your deck because the meta is a cyclical cyclical cycle. I don't know how many times I can say circle in the same sentence. Uh, but yeah, m what's really, really interesting here is three copies of Let It Go. Uh, I suppose this is a way to deal with steel decks or get some more early removal, uh, but you can sing. Uh, you can sing, uh, sing Let It Go with Maui, so that's a nice synergy there. And then we are running only two copies of Medusa and Tremaine. 
maybe if they were concerned about the Amber Steel matchup, the free copies of Let It Go would help remove Cinderella's, if, because that's be able to be shifted onto on turn 5, whereas Maleficent, which is your other answer, only comes out on turn 9. Because even Scar only has 6 attacks, so cannot remove a Cinderella. Yeah, and then we've got the, obviously for card draw and for scrying, we have the four copies of Grand Martala, four copies of Haram, three copies of Gaston, which can quest for free as well on top of scrying and grabbing a card. As we mentioned, the 2-2 split on Medusa and Tremaine, four copies of Be Prepared, love this, two copies of Dime, two copies of Scar, and then 4-4 four, four on Tamatar and Maleficent, making it a very top-heavy deck. I mean, yeah, just what an amazing medical for this tournament. It has great matchups into so many decks, especially with how popular Amber Steel has been recently. And just massive, massive congratulations, Christopher, on winning the largest Lorcana tournament in history. And a big thank you to Faya and Lorcana Play Network for hosting it. And it's amazing how much money was raised for charity overall uh, as well. This has just been an insane tournament. I loved playing in it. Uh, I think the best of two formats really interesting, even if I don't agree with the extra point. We're going first. I'm just, oh man, I'm so happy to be playing Lokana right now. This game's great. Competitive's great. I hope you guys are excited for the set championships and for the first organized play tournaments because I am pumped. But yeah, congratulations once again, Christopher, and I'll be seeing you guys in the next video.